good afternoon everyone welcome to our mini workshop today um, my name is devanshi i'm a part of the techx team um, we we are the organizing team and this was uh, organized in collaboration with uh, venture studio and the bad university and we also thank uh, the national biopharma mission and birac for the support uh, towards this uh, organizing of this uh, event um, we'll just start with a very quick introduction to venture center and uh, techx so um venture center is india's uh, leading inventive business incubator we are in, uh, located at the ncl innovation park which is very close to the uh, csir national chemical laboratory in pune uh, venture center is a section 8 non profit uh, incorporated company as uh, it, it has been named entrepreneurship development center it was incorporated back in 2007 and uh, it was it is currently hosted at uh, csr ncl like i mentioned and we are the first incubator in the csr system we are approved by government agencies such as nstdb and birac and are recognized by dsir and dipp we are also a credal accredited not for profit um, and we are eligible for csr funding um venture center was also awarded uh, a few uh, prestigious incubator and technology on uh, technology entrepreneurship related awards uh, national entrepreneurship award being uh, the most recent one in 2019 um uh, venture center's aim is to nucleate and nurture technology and knowledge based enterprises for india by leveraging the scientific engineering competencies of the institution in the region um our focus areas are um, in the given domains of uh, healthcare biotech biomed life sciences energy sustainability engineering electronics uh, engineering devices agro secondary agriculture nutrition and food um we focus on promoting inventive enterprises and spin offs from r and d organizations uh, specifically we are sector agnostics but uh, some of our strengths have been mentioned as below uh so techx is uh, we we are actually a technology transfer hub at uh, the venture center we are supported by national biopharma mission of birac and our goal is to facilitate win win technology commercialization partnerships so we are a designated uh, rtto in the western zone uh, we uh, service organizations based out of uh, maharashtra goa gujarat and madhya pradesh our mission is to catalyze connects between technology developers and technology commercialization entities forge industry collaborations and advance research closer to the market in a win win partnership um we also facilitate exchange and transactions related to any science and engineering based technology ideas uh, we are basically a resource center of venture center um techx also provide services in three broad domains which are mentioned here so we basically help innovators and technology commercialization entities with tech transfer and ip related services this includes technology marketing tech transfer related support uh, spin off and new venture creation uh, uh quite a bit of support in the ip related areas as well such as uh, ip protection search and analytics policies institutional mechanisms etc and uh, with respect to the industry we also uh, engage in technology scouting and open innovation related services and uh, basically help uh, catalyze technology innovation through, through such services so i'll just briefly uh, talk about the speaker at the event today so we have dr premnath who is currently the head of uh, ncl innovations at csr ncl pune and founder director of venture center dr premnath is a technologist innovation and incubation manager startup mentor and a co-founder of two medtech startups his journey in technology development and commercialization began with a breakthrough material for hip and knee joint replacement that he co-invented that uh, sorry that he co-invented and has been implanted in more than a million patients worldwide he is an alumnus of uh, the mit in the us iit bombay and has been a chevening technology enterprise scholar in cambridge uk so with this i'll uh, invite dr premnath to share his screen and uh, take the uh, stage over from here uh just a few um house rules right now so we would request everyone to stay on mute and uh, the video turned off at all the times any questions that you have please put it in the chat box and we'll take them up at the end of the session and um, we'll we'll let the stage be taken over by dr premna thank you everyone can you see my slides yes sir visible 
Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Uh, the session today is an introduction to technology commercialization. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Ahmedabad University and the Venture Studio at Ahmedabad University for uh, suggesting this topic and uh, something which uh, they felt would be of interest and use to them. So uh, today I plan to cover uh, some uh, 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 key topics in technology commercialization. Uh, and I would be, um, um, I would be um, using a few slides which have uh, um, been given to me courtesy also uh, Orin Hershowitz from Columbia and Ashley Stevens from um, uh, ex Boston University uh, located in Boston uh, currently. Uh, NCL Innovations uh, is a department of NCL which is focused on trying to build routes to market uh, for NCL uh, and uh, for especially innovation uh, and Venture Center is our incubator which is located, uh, it's an independent not-for-profit incubator located in the larger uh, NCL uh, campus. So. Uh, today, uh, this session is actually that it's meant for academic and R&D institutes. Uh, some of you I realize would be startups out here or companies and um, you might uh, uh, want to look at it slightly differently as well. And uh, one of the resources for this would be the AIM Prime YouTube channel, which you can all uh, refer to if you're startups out here. So today's uh, session is focused more on academic and R&D institutes. So before I start, I'll do a quick uh, uh, audience poll and I request uh, uh, all of you to participate. So here I'm just uh, uh, unsharing for a moment. Uh, please look at your uh, um, look at your chat box. Okay, uh, there is a, a link coming up there. Can I request you to quickly do a quick poll? Click on the link. You will see a screen, uh, and uh, uh, please just give me quick responses. So the questions that are being posed there are: Which category best describes you? Are you a researcher? Um, you know, a facilitator, an entrepreneur, or a leader in a research institute or student, uh, and your top reasons for your interest in this uh, mini workshop. So can I request you to take two minutes to quickly just give me some feedback? Yeah, good. I can see star responses coming in very quickly. There's just a two minute, very quick poll. So... Yeah. Okay, somebody wants a link again. Here it is. Uh, we have the numbers coming up. Just give me a minute and I'll put it up for you. Okay. Can you see my screen, Devanshi? Uh, yes, it's visible. Okay, so we have about 32 responses. Okay, a large uh, group of uh, researchers and technology developers out here. Uh, a few leaders taking decisions uh, and uh, in some facilitators and some entrepreneurs. Okay, and your top reason, the number one reason is you are a facilitator wanting to help. Uh, and you have an invention or a technology, you're looking uh, for a licensor. Okay, so good. So this is what uh, um, composition of the audience. So perhaps uh, uh, what I'm trying to do here is uh, relevant uh, to the audience as well. So let me continue with my uh, presentation. Um, so uh, this, as I said, is aimed at uh, people from academic research institutions, especially uh, inventors themselves or facilitators and decision makers will probably find it useful. So first of all, I want to build, uh, um, use this opportunity to talk a little bit about nomenclature, technology commercialization as a whole. Uh, then look at a few things, uh, uh, you know, that might motivate you perhaps to look at technology commercialization Then look at what is known about technology commercialization from others' experience. Uh, and then 
talk a few things to nuts and bolts about setting up institutional policies, look at routes to market and routes to market in terms of startups and spin outs as well, and then close. Okay, so that is what I'm planning to do uh, uh, today. So uh, let me begin. So when I talk about technology commercialization, these, this is the nomenclature that I am going to use. Of course, everybody uh, has their own definitions, but um, this is what I find uh, useful. So when I talk about technology, I'm basically talking about a recipe, okay? And, and knowing how to solve a particular problem. Invariably, there's a problem, unmet need or a customer pain point of some kind for any technology. Uh, and then there's a solution that somebody is providing uh, for it. Now, the nature of solution can be of two different types. One is it's purely technical. Another is it's organizational or there's a business process involved or a combination of the two. Uh, and uh, when you talk about technology commercialization, what one is talking about is technology taken to the market. That is the market introduction of it. Technology, which is in the shelf, uh, is not commercialized. It doesn't qualify under this category. But Market introduction is the true test of technology commercialization. When I talk about invention, I'm talking about a specific type of technology where there is an element of novelty. Um, but there are various other ways of looking at it, but uh, that's got to be, that's a little contextual. For example, uh, as I will tell you, um, you know, in if, under the law, it is patentable. That's a patentable invention, right? If there is a strong element of science in it, it is a scientific invention, right? But at the end of the day, invention is about technology and the global sense of novelty about it, something new about it that you're talking about. And that's why it's an invention. It's a type of technology. And innovation is basically taking that invention and taking it to market. So in a way, innovation is a, a, a type of technology commercialization, where there's an element of novelty uh, that is injected into that um, activity. So this is the nomenclature that I shall use. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit out here. I hope uh, uh, you can catch on to it um, as we go along. So when we talk about taking a technology to market, um, we are talking about basically putting a problem and solution together at the left end into an idea can doing some proof of concepts, prototypes, rights, trials, commercial production and a product uh, in use. The early part is the invention. You would have noticed that when I talk about technology, I'm including any kind of recipe. I am not necessarily talking about only science-based uh, technology. And uh, you, uh, you will know there, there's a following part after the early part of invention, which is the journey to market. And that, by the way, uh, is very often the real hard work that one needs to put in to take things to market. Uh, the early part is very interesting to most researchers, very exciting, but the later part is what really uh, is the one that tests whether you really end up taking the thing to market or not. Uh, while I'm showing it as a linear graph out here, it's never and very rarely is it linear uh, and uh, very rarely is it untangled. That means there'll be multiple such lines of work uh, interacting with each other. And I will show you an example of that today as well. Uh, very recent example uh, from what all of you have been hearing in the news um, as well, uh, where there's a lot of tangling that is happening between different streams of work. Uh, and so it's never so simple, but for the purposes of learning, this is uh, uh, good enough uh, uh, for now. Innovation, as I told you, is the market introduction of an invention, right, of, an, of something that is a novelty. And uh, this is the economist definition of an uh, innovation. Schumpeter, who was a famous economist, defined innovation as a market introduction of a technical or organizational novelty, technical as in uh, based on some technical principles, you're building something new, uh, or an organizational or a business process novelty that you're building, uh, that you've used to develop the solution for the problem uh, that you are addressing. And But at the end of the day, there has to be market introduction. Otherwise, it's not innovation. An example of an innovation, which is uh, which is the technology-led, uh, with technical novelty-led is, uh, for example, the BioNTech vaccine. Yeah. Can I request uh, muting, please, uh, everybody, to? Yeah. Um, Devanshi, please mute. 
Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and when I talk about organizational novelty, I'm talking about um, an example is Uber, for example. It's a business process innovation. They have worked around. They have changed the way the whole field of um, taxis and uh, vehicles for higher work. And that is a business process novelty that they are using to solve a particular problem, right? Uh, you can have multiple routes to market. Uh, the most common that you hear of, one is of course a technology transfer to an existing company. So imagine a large company uh, where you're transferring technology and they take and run with it. And there's another uh, one that you hear about is setting up a new company and uh, that's typically a startup if it is foresight led, that's what it is called. Uh, and if there is an equity arrangement, it's called a spin out of some kind. If there is any equity linked rewards associated with creating that startup, it's uh, the nomenclature of spin out is used. Uh, and then there are many other ways of taking things to market. And uh, there are several, you, if you're a larger company, you might do everything in-house, uh, right from technology development to commercialization. You could look at different partnership models, which are much more complex have a lot more different varieties of uh, uh, of how uh, uh, you know um, um, how uh, technology is transferred to the market. So, uh, of course, uh, you all of you uh, um, are uh, very familiar with the ones on the right hand side. Google, for example, was formed because of a technology license, a patent license from uh, Stanford uh, to the founders. Uh, you hear a lot about uh, Elon Musk and his companies. Uh, many of them are on different, different themes and there is an element of technology associated with each of these, be it SpaceX involving space technology, Tesla involving EV technologies, battery technologies, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but there is also this other side of very large landmark licensing deals, for example, uh, Wisconsin Madison's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, tech transfer office, which is called WARF, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, uh, which originally managed the patents uh, for vitamin D. Uh, for uh, Wisconsin and, uh, you know, in many, in, our, in recent years, uh, some of the em embryonic stem cell uh, patents uh, are held uh, by them. And of course, the famous Stanford recombinant DNA patents, uh, the Cohen-Boyer patents, as they're called, which is licensed to a whole uh, bunch of companies which went on to uh, come out from that platform technology uh, in, uh, um, uh, in the biotechnology field uh, as well. So these are two prominent ways of looking at uh, how take, things are taken to market. And uh, uh, there are examples from India as well and from NCL uh, where um, I come from. Um, and when this whole chain works uh, seamlessly and you're able to find partners to transfer it, uh, you are able to build different types of products. Uh, uh, and uh, NCL has been successful in the past working with companies, for example, and in not-for-profits uh, to transfer technologies where they take it to some distance and then a partner takes over and runs with it. Uh, and this, uh, this can have considerable success in the US. Uh, this is still uh, the main form of technology uh, transfer, whereas in UK, uh, this is actually taken number two place after startups, but increasingly startups are becoming uh, important uh, uh, as I will uh, show you uh, in the following slides as well. Uh, but when this doesn't work, that's when the problem really arises. And when that happens, you have to look at other routes. And uh, also why that happens also, we will discuss a little bit and you can have a bunch of startups and spin outs based on different technologies. These, for example, are some of them from NCL that we uh, deal with as examples. Companies focus on different things like diagnostics, the devices, uh, uh, packaging, uh, energy, and so on and so forth. Okay. So at this point, I will take a short breather and I'll put up another form. I'm going to ask you a very simple uh, uh, question, um, which is, um, please tell me when you think about technology commercialization, what is it that you motivates you, right? So here is another link. There's a form that I have sent online on your chat box. Uh, just click on that, please open up and you'll be able to um, uh, fill that up quickly. I, it's just a very short form again, just like the previous one that you filled up. Okay. 
Can I have some responses, please? Yeah, I'm beginning to get responses. Can you see my screen, Devanshi? Yes. I have only one response so far. So the questions are these, why do you think, um, what do you think is the top reason for you, uh, your institution focus on technology commercialization? And if you were keen, take your idea to market, which would be your most preferred route? Okay, so one is on reasons why you should be doing technology commercialization. And so let's look at it. So, so far there are about 15, 16 responses. 50% are looking at demonstrate real world usefulness and impact of research. Uh, another has voted for contribute to socioeconomic development of the country, right? Uh, and uh, routes to market, we are seeing a split again between, uh, uh, so the major part, major group is looking at building a startup where I can also participate as a co-founder. And uh, the second big uh, category is licensing to a new startup. Uh, licensing to a large company is about 20%. Okay, uh, that's a revelation. I thought many of you would be looking at licensing to a large company. So we have about 35 responses and I think we are stable at that point. So we'll continue uh, with that. So let's look at uh, what the realities of the situation and uh, continue with the discussion uh, in in my slides, right? Okay, so let's look at why technology commercialization. Uh, each of you have expressed your views. Now let's talk a little bit about um, different kinds of motivations for different people, right? Uh, this is what motivates me, which is sol solving problems, right, for people. Uh, and it's satisfying to empower people. Uh, and this is something which many people are, many scientists and engineers would like to see uh, happen with their uh, work. But of course, there is this larger issue which one has to keep in mind as well. This virtuous cycle of uh, sustaining innovation and sol solving problems. Um, funding and investment of different kinds go into new technology ideas journey and taking it to market. And this could be uh, different things. For example, government funding or corporates funding it uh, or any kind of investments happening. All of these uh, directing it towards new ideas, building them, taking them to market, and that eventually for creating products, services, and companies, and which, of course, resulting in profits, taxes, and then funding back, right? Even the grants that the government pays is out of these profits, uh, which result in taxes, which again are directed by the government towards uh, new ideas. So if this cycle is broken, you can clearly imagine that it's just not possible to sustain innovation. Uh, and also any background scientific research that one wants to do uh, to make innovation uh, possible. So this is the larger picture. But of course, when we are working as individuals, we think about just making a dent and making a contribution ourselves using some of our uh, own uh, um, ideas. Uh, it's also a fact that increasingly, uh, the world uh, is seeing uh, intangible assets, knowledge-based assets forming the bulk of the value that is being created in the economy. So for example, if you compare between 1975 and 2018 in this graphic out here, you will see in 1975, all these companies which are listed here, the majority of the value that was, uh, uh, that the assets that they were holding was tangible. Uh, uh, and today, if you look at it, look at the companies uh, at the other end, uh, such a big sea change, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, so on. And a lot of intangible assets uh, that are the blue blue part represents intangible uh, um, assets and and that is the lion's share uh, of um, uh, you know the assets that are being uh, created uh, and valued. Uh, of course, if you look at the tech transfer data in the U.S., and uh, you will also see uh, that there is a significant move in the direction of building an innovation economy, strengthening it. Of course, it's already an innovation economy in the U.S., but many other countries are following this trend uh, and trying to build a lot more value from the knowledge uh, that is being generated in uh, universities and uh, um, um, and various other places which are doing uh, research, including 
in the public labs, industry, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this and this tremendous contribution coming in, um, in uh, as I will show you these uh, uh, these numbers when looked at separate independently look very large and they are very significant but actually the contribution to the economy and society as a whole is much larger uh, than what you would see even in these numbers because there's a lot of diffusion effect uh, that uh, uh, happens uh, when technology uh, is translated and the economy benefits uh, from it so the us this is us data by the way uh, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, since the bedol act in 1980 uh, there's been a significant number of uh, uh, you know econo i mean economic significant uh, level of economic and social contributions from uh, universities and of course as you know the left and the, the both the east and the west coast of the us are uh, the power centers economic power centers of the us and both sides uh, are driven essentially uh, from uh, because of some of the r d and the academic uh, uh, universities uh, in that area really contributing in a big way to how uh, innovation uh, drives the economy in these two uh, uh, regions uh, of the us so uh, we also hear about all these uh, stories of how uh, MIT or Stanford are contributing in such large ways to the economy. Uh, and it is a fact. I mean, it is well known that this is indeed so. There are very large contributions that are coming up. Uh, and uh, it is uh, impressive and at the same time inspiring for many of us to uh, also try and replicate some of these things uh, in our own uh, regions. Uh, this is a snapshot from the recent uh, uh, Stanford uh, University Office of Technology Licensing report, and uh, in 50 years, uh, they have you know the, the large number that you see at the bottom is about two billion dollars uh, in revenue, in cumulative uh, revenue, which, as I will tell you, is not as large, but nonetheless very significant, um, and. Uh, um, uh, 415 startups and cumulus, you know, more than 13,000 cumulative licenses and so on. And a lot of economic contribution that is coming out of it. This is a snapshot of spin outs from Oxford uh, University. And you will see uh, this huge spurt in spin outs uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, this in UK, the last 20 years have seen a phenomenal increase in the number of spin outs. And uh, the proportion of uh, contribution of spin outs and startups in technology commercialization in the UK uh, is actually uh, uh, very large in proportion to uh, what happens through regular licensing, unlike uh, the US, where uh, in the US it's still licensing uh, that uh, dominates. And of course, there are all these recent and new role models uh, that. Uh, we are seeing, uh, including uh, uh, role models for scientists have changed so significantly. Um, for example, the 2018 Nobel Prize winner, Francis Arnold, has several startups. Jennifer Doudna, the inventor of uh, CRISPR, uh, has several startups uh, uh, as well, and, and she's a Nobel uh, Prize winner for 2020. Um, and there's a and, and there's a very good chance that we might have a Nobel Prize winner this year from uh, BioNTech. Of course, these are two founders. I'll tell you more about the third person in the team uh, who may be the Nobel uh, Prize winner this, uh, this year if uh, predictions are to go by. Um, Langer, Professor Langer, for example, is an outstanding chemical engineer and uh, uh, has built several companies uh, around some of the work that he has done, more than 20 plus uh, startups. And Professor Friend, who actually inaugurated the Venture Center uh, 15 years, roughly 15 years ago, um, is also a founder of several startups. He's also a Cavendish professor. So uh, it is nice to see um, how things that moving uh, in a direction of seeing value creation from science on the field in terms of products and services. And of course, this famous name of Bose, of Professor Amar Bose uh, from MIT, who set up the Bose Corporation, and the name is now a global name, an Indian name, which is global. Uh, and it's a matter of pride for all of us to see such companies uh, um, uh, out there, um, you know, setting the pace uh, for innovation in specific fields. So India too has had uh, inspiring stories. I, there are many I could tell you, but I just wanted to leave you uh, with a few based on my own background. Um, it's actually important to um, understand that, uh, you know, 
it was way back in 1892 that Dr. Praful Chandra Ray uh, set up the Bengal Chemical Works. And, uh, you know, this is, an, this is an early example of modern scientific entrepreneurship in a sense. Uh, and uh, it's impressive. I mean, the company still exists, of course, in a different, very different avatar, but nonetheless, a company that is uh, still there uh, more than 100 years since its uh, founding. Um, and of course, today's modern day role models, uh, right from Kiran Majundar Shaw to Krishna Ella to uh, Pramod Chaudhary, Adar Punawala, uh, and uh, all the other uh, stalwarts uh, on this page. Dr. Reddy's uh, founder, Dr. Anji Reddy, is an alumnus of NCL. And of course, coming from NCL, I'm very proud to um, uh, you know, uh, say that he's built such a phenomenal pharma company for the country uh, and is a role model for many chemists around the country uh, as well. Uh, and in the Venture Center itself, there are several companies which are coming up, which have, uh, which are doing outstanding work, uh, um, and some have really uh, stood out in recent times, of course, including uh, MyLab, which set, uh, got the first uh, registered uh, uh, approved uh, um, RT-PCR kit in India for COVID-19, first citywide demonstration of organic waste uh, to bio CNG, and several other firsts. Uh, these are all scientists entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers who are building uh, technology-based ideas and products based on them uh, as well. So, uh, so I think the message here is that there is a lot uh, that you can achieve through technology commercialization of great value for society. And as many of you want to do something which will demonstrate the value of your own science and at the same time also deliver some socioeconomic benefits, I think there are enough there is enough uh, uh, of traction right now globally uh, for to make that happen, and there is enough of role, there are adequate number of role models in India to make that happen as well. So now let's look at what is stopping us. What is it that uh, what is it that is troubling us, and wh why is it such a difficult uh, animal? Why is it that we struggle uh, with technology commercialization? So let me take a few moments to try and discuss what is known about technology commercialization, and then come back uh, to ask you again what you perceive as uh, different difficulties. The first lesson, I've structured it as a bunch of lessons. The first uh, lesson that one learns when you look in technology commercialization is much, 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 much of the hard work, time, money actually follows the invention stage. It is not the invention itself uh, that is you know, the difficult part. It's the thing that follows that, right? Of course, you need to be creative uh, in the invention. You need, there, it's, not, uh, it's not trivial. I'm not trying to trivialize it, but much of the work that follows is after uh, the stage of invention. The journey to market is what is the real uh, uh, difficult part which one needs to focus on. And very often you need technology translators at that stage. And if people who do not recognize the importance of it, do it at their own peril and cost. So if you think that you can do everything, it's possible to take everything out on your own, it is not uh, uh, easy. And at the same time, uh, history shows that you need very often uh, good technology translators to make this happen. So, uh, and that includes entrepreneurs, that includes your partners in industries who are willing to put in their efforts to try and commercialize it. So that is something which we should keep in mind uh, always. So in this linear model that I had shown you, which of course, as I told you, is idealistic, um, you, this later part where you spend most of your time, money, effort, and so on and so forth, has to be navigated if your invention has to be remembered. And um, otherwise, it's just going to lie out there and forgotten. Uh, the all, you, all the things that are you remember today are remembered because it hit the end point, right? Uh, an electric bulb that you think of reached the end point, serves your purpose. Today, it is a product that is in use, and therefore, you remember uh, its inventors. Um, and that too, uh, you know, inventors, um, uh, you know, the, the, the key people who conceptualized it, some of them who really probably first conceptualized it as a possible light source, uh, you may have forgotten actually, but you still remembered some few key people who made it possible to take it to market and brought it to uh, reality. Um, 
here is a, uh, for some of you, if you're facilitators, you may want to read this uh, story. Uh, this is a news article that came in the public broadcasting service uh, in the US uh, uh, about the real story behind penicillin. Um, of course, we all remember Dr. Alexander Fleming for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, uh, inventing uh, or discovering uh, that uh, discovering penicillin and that is something which uh, definitely he deserves credit but uh, what followed after that is also very interesting there were years of hard work um, um, between 1928 and 1938 there was hardly any progress and professor fleming's or uh, dr fleming's original uh, observations was just lying there described somewhere uh, until uh, this team from oxford really took it on themselves uh, to uh, you know, uh, develop the methods to actually isolate the active ingredient, purify it, um, figuring out, you know, what it's effective against, how to use it and producing adequate quantities for testing. And this team of Lori, uh, Chain and Heatley uh, were actually responsible for that piece of work. Um, uh, the Nobel Prize in this field went to Fleming, Flory, and I think Chain. Uh, Heatley was left out, but he got some other uh, honors, but you can see that there's a long effort that went uh, to take it there and the, the people who make it possible taking it to the next level are, are very, very uh, important. Otherwise, today you wouldn't be, wouldn't be talking about Alexander Fleming uh, at all if these people had not put in that uh, effort to make that um, happen. Uh, and that's an important lesson for all the scientists because this, you tend to overemphasize the importance of the the, the, the creative moment, but it's also important to recognize the importance of people who take it all the way uh, to, uh, uh, to a product or even to, uh, you know, a point where it is all believable, demonstrable, and so on and so forth. Another lesson is uh, that gaps in perception of value, okay, are very common. That means there's a different perception you might have of how valuable your technology is, and there might be a different perception that industry and other people at the other end might have. And uh, in this process, it is very difficult to predict winners. Uh, these are things that make it very difficult to bet on specific technologies. So um, if you look at uh, on the left side where academia works typically, um, you know, you have a sense of what might be important because you have a different reading of the future or, or the or understanding of the science as it progresses. Uh, and industry has a different perception of market opportunities, what it wants to do, uh, and so on and so forth. And there is a difference between the two. There's a difference in foresight. There's a difference in perception. Uh, the difference in risks, uh, perception of risk or reward. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's also this issue uh, of uh, people in the industry not seeing it as their own. Right. So you need champions very often to take it to the uh, other end, even the industry side people who, who, <coughs> who see value in what you're doing and are willing to work with you to take it uh, uh, to the other side. And this perception, this gap in, uh, uh, in uh, you know, interests, motivations, expectations are actually is actually very, very common. It is not uh, 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 very rare. Uh, this is a very recent news article from a uh, news feature from Nature, uh, which describes the invention of the mRNA uh, vaccine. And uh, I put it out here just to highlight. Um, so one of the companies involved in this whole uh, uh, business is CureVac. And, uh, you know, once when the CureVac uh, founders uh, was, uh, founder was presenting some of the data uh, on uh, their mRNA platform, uh, there was a Nobel Prize winner standing in the first row saying that this is completely shit. What you're telling us here is completely shit. Okay, so you can understand that this is this is not unusual and this is something which uh, you see a lot uh, whenever you're building new technologies, especially if it is uh, if it's very different or um, uh, moving away from what uh, the convention is uh, at uh, that uh, time. Um, and that, of course, makes it difficult for many people developing technologies to take things uh, uh, to market uh, as well. Uh, yet another lesson, which is a humbling lesson for many scientists and researchers, is that while recent advances in science are an important source of innovation, uh, but 
uh, they are neither always necessary nor always sufficient. Okay, um, and there are many, many innovations around the world which uh, don't necessarily leverage the recent advances in in uh, science. Uh, and sometimes, even to advance your science, you uh, the ideas based on your science, you may need to leverage many other things which have got nothing to do uh, with science. For example, even a business process innovation uh, that you need to bring along with your technical innovation to take it uh, ahead uh, into the market. A common example of an invention, say, which doesn't involve as much science, of course, there's some foundational science, perhaps associated with materials and so on, but uh, not really recent scientific advances are inventions such as these, like zip or a Velcro, for example. Both of these uh, are very important inventions. They play a very important role in uh, for our uh, society. Uh, they've created a lot of wealth, value, and uh, benefits, but uh, you know, science is not necessarily at the heart of uh, these uh, inventions. When many of us are working uh, in uh, in uh, um, in uh, scientific ideas, um, uh, we uh, tend to sometimes think in boxes. And uh, there's a book uh, called The Pasture's Quadrant, which uh, tries to frame this whole uh, activity in the set in the form of. Uh, four box quadrant. Uh, so on the left here, you see uh, the y-axis as quest for fundamental understanding. And on the right-hand side, you see considerations for, of use, right? Um, uh, and uh, the author here, of course, uh, is tilting towards the pastures quadrant as the title of the book says, and wants to project that. But I wanted to point out here that when you look at Bohr's quadrant, where apparently considerations of use are relatively lower, what you will often find uh, is uh, that um, it's only a matter of time. I mean, uh, uh, any kind of scientific activity that you do, which is as long as it's good science, uh, probably finds its use at some point. So for a, a good example of this is say for the relativity, theory of relativity being used in say the GPS or the Raman effect being used in Raman detectors for various different um, applications uh, today. Um, but at the same time, uh, um, you know, you, uh, you might want to do science which has relevance in a shorter time frame, right? Uh, not that anything is wrong there. It's a matter of personal uh, preference. And an extreme example of that would be people on the probably the right hand quadrant, uh, bottom quadrant, the Edison quadrant mentioned here, uh, who are just who are using the latest developments or even old developments in science and technology to put them together to solve problems. Examples would be, for example, autonomous vehicles or retro reflective tapes that you see on the uh, on the road side signs and highways, uh, which reflect light back at you from whichever angle you're shining it. These are all great ideas, great products uh, and technologies, uh, uh, but uh, you know, they are not necessarily uh, driven by, uh, uh, by in the same way as what is shown here as the pastures quadrant, which is use inspired basic research. And that is something which uh, uh, um, many scientists are told is the ideal uh, location to be, but I don't necessarily uh, uh, don't necessarily uh, um, go along with that. I think all of these are okay as long as you're working towards uh, um, a, the goal of making your science useful. It's only a matter of time. If you feel that you uh, are happier delivering results in a shorter time frame, you'll probably be tilted towards uh, the Edison's uh, quadrant. And this actually, instead of being a quadrant, a four box quadrant is probably three boxes in a row uh, with just time, decide, uh, you know, the time to impact being a little longer in one and uh, shorter uh, in the uh, other. Uh, but it does take time. Okay, and many, very often, uh, science-based ideas take longer than other ideas that you might be building businesses or tech or solutions around. Um, so this is the timeline for, for example, for Raman. Uh, 1928 is when Raman's, uh, you know, landmark publication in Nature came about, uh, and uh, the first spectroscope roughly came around 53, and it was only in around uh, early uh, late uh, 90s or 2000s that one started seeing these handheld. Uh, devices uh, coming up uh, eventually. So it does take time. It is not something sometimes that you can rush. Uh, there is, an, uh, there is uh, that element which you cannot change uh, easily in science-based, uh, in translating science-based ideas to market. 
Another lesson and observation that I wanted to bring about is that in most cases, we find that you need a supportive ecosystem uh, to make uh, to ensure uh, this translation. And that supportive ecosystem has uh, many different uh, aspects to it. Uh, when you're commercializing technology, uh, it's not only what you did in the lab or the research workers that you have in your lab. There'll be multiple buckets of funding, which are illustrated below. Research funding, proof of concept funding, scale up funding, market entry funding, growth funding. All of these have to fall in place eventually if you want to get uh, things to market. There might be multiple people involved, multiple skills, multiple capabilities, multiple facilities that you might need to leverage taking uh, uh, things uh, to market. And that is something which also adds to the complexity of technology, taking things to market and, uh, you know, in the process of technology commercialization. And in all this, uh, there are uh, there are there have to be very often players who are nuclei for innovation ecosystems who fill up those gaps in selected areas. So, uh, you know, in, in many ways, Venture Center sees itself as an ecosystem enabler, uh, which is trying to fill up uh, some of these gaps. And so I would think would also be the goal of Venture Studio in Ahmedabad University, which is trying to build up some of these stepping stones, which will take things to market. So there will be gaps in between, which will need to be filled up. And it is for you to choose a few, which you can fill up and therefore ensure that the ecosystem is in place. If the ecosystem is not in place, this gentleman stepping on the first stone will not be able to cross over to the next uh, stone, um, just because there is no way to uh, do that. A example could be, uh, imagine a situation where you're working on uh, certain medical uh, devices uh, and uh, let's say that you need to get uh, a particular study done uh, and yeah, there's no way to get it done in your vicinity. You might move to another ecosystem and get it done, but that will be a stumbling block in your ecosystem to get it done. Right? Okay. Yet another lesson is that interestingly, uh, innovation thrives in tangled co-developments in other fields. That means it is not a linear graph which is disentangled from all other developments happening uh, in the field. A recent example of this uh, uh, came up uh, very recently, and I'm, I'm I'm just trying to see. I'm trying to. Uh, this is something which I've just pulled out uh, from a recent nature uh, piece. Uh, this is the history of the mRNA vaccine. And what you're seeing here uh, are uh, three columns. The first one is the mRNA technology itself. The second is a lipid-based delivery system. And the third is the putting the two together to form the uh, vaccine. And uh, you will see that uh, the whole journey began in 1960 and has been progressing. The multiple developments that happened over a period of time uh, and uh, the companies uh, to commercialize all of this started forming somewhere here. So the first mRNA focused company uh, was around uh, late uh, 1990s. CureVac in about 2000s and BioNTech in about, um, you know, 2008, Moderna in about 2010, right? Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, there were several developments happening, but there was a trigger at some point. And this trigger uh, was primarily developments in the mRNA field here and enabling developments and that tangled innovation happening, co-development happening in lipid-based delivery systems. And that if imagine a situation where you were not aware of it, you did not have access to it, or you didn't know how to set up those arrangements to access it, you can imagine that you would be slow in uh, you know, realizing the importance of it or taking it to market. Uh, um, as of now, uh, the, it seems that uh, the most important step in this whole uh, process was this discovery uh, here in 2005 of the modified uh, uh, RNA that evades immune detection. Uh, and if that is indeed uh, recognized as the most important, it's probably the one that will receive the Nobel Prize. But uh, if you can imagine that this triggered off uh, this particular development was something which was was very central to the rest of the innovation taking place in the product side of taking creating vaccines, uh, therapeutics, and so on and so forth. Okay. One other lesson I wanted to leave with you uh, for many of you to think about is that innovation is a portfolio game of numbers and odds. <laughs> 
and there is no evidence that one can pick winners up front. This is actually very surprising to many people who sit on committees and uh, select uh, uh, people to fund and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, perhaps what they're doing is weeding out those which have serious problems rather than um, rather than really picking winners. Um, if you, I mean, just give them due credit for that. But that said, uh, there is an assumption sometimes in many institutions that you can pick winners and that you can bet on winners. And that is something which is uh, uh, the, the numbers do not actually, or the evidence for, for, uh, for that does just uh, does not exist. Um, including the best of cases, nobody has been able to predict uh, winners. And part of the reason is the complexity of the whole process. Just having good technology doesn't cut it. You need to have an ecosystem. You need to have uh, co-developments happening. You need to have many mother things happening. And this has implications for facilitators, uh, decision makers on in terms of how they want to build their innovation ecosystem in their own organizations. So here is some data from uh, US universities. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, this, this funnel data on the left is a little dated and the one in the orange on the top is uh, more recent. Uh, but uh, you will notice that uh, there's a lot of research funding going in to produce invention disclosures and that gets filtered into patent applications as out of them some get awarded and then there are some uh, of them which get uh, licensed. So what do the numbers look like? And you can see the, 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 that there's a drop, steep drop happening as you go along, right? So in 2018, uh, the US universities spent $72 billion uh, in research expenditure and uh, it took them, costed them almost $10 million, which is about 70 crores for every uh, four invention disclosures that they produced. And uh, almost again, 70 crores for every 0.12 product. That means 700 crores per product that hit the market eventually, right? Uh, and new startups as well. So you can, you can see number one, that it involves considerable amounts of money Maybe in India, we can do it a little cheaper, but nonetheless, it is, it is, there's a large pipeline, which is feeding, uh, um, uh, which is creating all the, all the, you know, opportunities in the US, which you see eventually as startups and technologies, which uh, we see around as, uh, uh, you know, things to uh, get inspired by and uh, work towards. Right. And of course, then further down, industry also funnels it. Right. So uh, and that's best seen in the pharma industry where, you know, uh, if you have a few candidate molecules, uh, the odds of one coming out as a successful product is very, very low indeed. Right. So that funneling happens as well. So it is definitely a numbers game and there's no doubt about it. And so therefore trying to bet on one as a as an institution or a portfolio manager is not a good idea. But when you're a scientist uh, looking at it, there's another approach to it, which is that you progress it gradually de-risk it step by step before you invest too much efforts in every uh, in uh, uh, in one particular line of work so you you progress it uh, as far as possible to get more and more confidence in what uh, you're doing uh, uh, um, in terms of technology development and commercialization um, and this graph here shows uh, that how many how many of these, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, how, how, how often did they make a lot of money on some of these uh, technologies, right? So if the US universities were, if you were to uh, put out uh, this a frequency chart, basically, you will see that there are very few at the right extreme, which have really made money. Okay. Uh, and one of these, by the way, these $200 million ones must be the recombinant DNA uh, patent family. Right. Uh, so very few inventions actually see the light of day, fewer still make uh, any money. But if you didn't have that pipeline, you wouldn't have anything at all. So you, you need to have a pool in order to have success stories. And it's very difficult to say upfront that it is, this is the one that is going to uh, be the big winner. A classic example of this, this, this is the Google patent. At that time, there were multiple search engines and there was no reason to believe that Google would be successful in, uh, you know, valorizing that patent. 
right? Uh, but it did happen. And uh, I, Stanford admits that that was not something which they could have predicted up front. But, but they bet on the students, uh, that uh, their own grad students who are going to take it to market and who are committed to that idea. Uh, so blockbusters are rare. Okay, they're very few. But they make, and the tricky part in all this is they make most of the money. So if you don't have a pool, uh, you will not even be able to show uh, as many results as blockbusters as well. So for managers in, uh, in these institutions and the leaders, they need to be clear that this is indeed the case. And therefore, uh, you need to build a pool and then hope and work towards trying to valorize them, uh, uh, create the ecosystems that support them and hopefully some of them uh, will create some revenue. But that said, uh, this revenue, as I will tell you, is nothing compared to the uh, research expenditure that you put in, okay? So uh, yet another lesson is taking ideas to market takes time and one cannot drop IP assets in a hurry. So if you're having patents and you have, you're have you investing in them, uh, just be clear that don't be in a great hurry to drop them. Even in the best of places, it is it takes time. And these are to be treated as options as and not as assets, okay? These are options for the future. When the opportunity strikes, you should be ready with it and timing is very important. And if you don't have anything in your hand at that point, you will not be able to leverage that at all. So here is some more data, actual data from uh, Colombia. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is right hands and the X axis the years from disclosure submission to the first license. And, uh, uh, you know, on the Y axis is cumulative percentage of licenses, uh, licensed uh, disclosure. So how many disclosures happened? Okay, out of the 100 that were licensed, uh, you know, how long does it take to get it licensed, right? And you can see the X axis is in years and you will see that uh, uh, out of, by the this is out of the, those got licensed, a small fraction get licensed, but out of them, uh, you know, 55% uh, deals were done by year three. So this whole idea that within three years, you can just close down uh, portfolios doesn't work. And in, in countries like India, where it takes longer to identify partners, it might take even longer than what you're seeing uh, in the case of the US. So big winners take many years to develop and they aren't always obvious at that time is another lesson uh, from the tech transfer uh, community. Uh, you can see in this in these cases uh, that significant revenue took uh, incubation for four to eight to 10 years uh, before anything came out. And all of them, you'll also notice, have a blip at the end. So the licensing income really kicks in only late, not early. So this whole idea that you can also squeeze out a lot upfront uh, is also flawed. Uh, and many Indian institutions suffer from that and therefore are not able to strike uh, good deals uh, in tech transfer uh, as well. Uh, there's also no evidence of self-financing R&D via technology transfer uh, income, right? So uh, um, this is roughly for Stanford University. The sponsored projects, it's about $2, million, $2 billion. And the gross technology income in 2019-20 was only about $114 million. So, you know, this idea that you could possibly be financing your research with the technology licensing income is entirely flawed. But that said, this $114 million uh, is a big deal because it translates into billions of socioeconomic impact in that region. And it's society and the economy as a whole that gains and not necessarily the institutions that are getting in. But, but that said, because Stanford has done that, they would have no shortage of support from various different quarters, be it industry, government, and so on and so forth for the research. Therefore, it makes sense for universities to do this, but they should not expect that, you know, licensing income is going to pay for uh, research. It doesn't happen. And there's no evidence that it will happen uh, either. Uh, and unfortunately, even in the highest circles, in uh, uh, there have been uh, people who have imagined that and uh, policies have been constructed around that, which is definitely flawed, right? Uh, yet another lesson is that this whole journey has chasms or inflection points at different points. Um, uh, there are places where the journey stops, halts. Sometimes you fall apart, it'll fall apart and you'll break up uh, as a company. If you're set up, you might, uh, you know, uh, so-called valley of death might happen. Um, and so, Navigating those chasms becomes an important part of technology commercialization. You need to know how to navigate those chasms, those 
points where there is a near death situation very often for many companies. And if you know how to do it, and if your ecosystem supports it, you will be able to do it. And for institutions, it's important to design ecosystems that help you uh, navigate that, uh, and that chasm uh, as well. So uh, a very obvious and simple one that one of the chasms which all of us would be able to recognize is where you get initial research grants to work on different ideas and different institutions. And, uh, you know, a lot of the VC or industry funding happens much later and there's a valley in between. But there's actual data behind this and uh, there's a book called camels, tigers, and unicorns, which tries to uh, document some of this. And you will find uh, that there are actually multiple chasms. And the chasm that you saw just now is actually right here in the beginning, uh, whereas there's a lot more before you can actually take companies and scale it up. <laughs> so if you want to build <clears throat> a company with scale uh, or, a, uh, or see the technology reach uh, as wide an audience as possible, uh, you're very often looking at crossing these three chasms, but the first one most academics face is right here in chasm one, and that is the earliest phase. Now, showing the vision of the future is something which every innovator has to do and has to sell it to everybody that this is possible, this, this climb that you're going to see there. And uh, of course, there will, be building, there will be naysayers, there will be people who won't believe you, uh, but that said, uh, having a vision of this and knowing how to cross these chasms becomes quite critical uh, for most people in technology uh, development um, uh, and commercialization activities. Otherwise, you know, you will be working at the left corner of it and uh, claiming everything that comes out of your lab with uh, uh, as a technology achievement without really uh, it ever seeing the light of day. Okay. Um, the last probably a uh, last two lessons here the one is uh, this this particular one is about how innovation progresses as a sequence of de-risking steps so if you are a researcher and you are doing technology development you might want to think about key risks or uncertainties and progressively de-risk it and this is something which is well known well documented where you progressively reduce risk. And as you risk, reduce risk, the value of the technology keeps going up and up. And this has to be done with a clear understanding that there are some milestones as far as risk is concerned, and you're retiring risks as you go along uh, in, in this uh, process. Uh, a, a good illustration of this, which you see in practices in the drug development process, where this has been documented quite well, where you go from research to discovery research to preclinical development to clinical trials and so on and so forth. And it's quite well known how much it costs, how the probability of success increases. And therefore, in this process, actually, you will find uh, that, you know, you're retiring in, in this, for example, you'll see in these numbers that you're retiring really 80% of the risk only when you're hitting phase three in before hitting phase one you're hardly retired five percent of the risk or one percent of the risk so so that is uh, uh, that clear understanding of risk and understanding how to navigate that process really helps you if you're really committed to taking technology uh, uh, right all the way to this end. the last lesson which i want to leave you with is that innovation is a team sport uh, it's a marathon and not a sprint that means you you can try and run as much as you want but there is a timing there is a timing to it there's it's also a team sport it is not something which you can very often individually do it and this is my favorite uh, picture for it um, uh, what you see on the left is Usain Bolt running the 100 meters dash and on the right is uh, uh, Kipchoge running uh, the two hour uh, marathon uh, and in this, there's a whole team of people supporting him to break the wind. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible. So here was an objective, which is a two hour marathon, which they had to complete. And there were a set of uh, people helping him do it. And very often, uh, you know, uh, uh, the scientist, uh, maybe one of these people breaking the wind for somebody who is a champion who uh, will champion the technology all the way to the end point. And it's important to realize that this does is quite important. In recent times, of course, uh, in BioNTech, uh, these two people, the founders of BioNTech, are the key people who made uh, uh, all this uh, uh, possible, uh, the mRNA vaccine. And, you know, a good sign of a person who is a champion is their belief in the potential, right? And so here, Sahin is talking about, um, you know, 
um, that if it works, it will be groundbreaking. And that is that is the opportunity that they saw in betting uh, on the mRNA vaccine when they set up uh, BioNTech. And these partners for commercialization, the champions in large companies, these are the champions on the industry side who are work, willing to work with the acad academics. And in, on, uh, in startups, it's the entrepreneur who is willing to bet his career, or his or her career, time, efforts in taking everything to market. Uh, they, they are very key. Uh, uh, to taking uh, ideas all the way um, across, okay? So uh, at this point, let me just come to a few uh, pointers for supportive institutional policies and strategies. So if you are part of the R&D management or leadership, what, what do you learn from this, right? So the first thing is that always focus on creating a strong pipeline of good ideas. It's a numbers game. Trim the pipeline. You can weed out some things which are not sound and so on, but do not try to pick winners. Okay. Um, invest progressively in de risking and reducing uncertainties. Uh, more can be invested as risks are retired, right? And partners will join as risks are retired. New investors will come in and so on and so forth. You set up policies to encourage, celebrate, and incentivize people investing time, money, and so on, and keep technology transfer terms simple, predictable, and uncertainty-free. So if somebody is willing to put in their effort to take technology to market, please help them as R&D managers and don't make life difficult for them uh, by giving them uncertain terms. Uh, do not design tech transfer policies with the aim of self-financing R&D with tech transfer income. That There's no evidence to that. Please don't do that. It essentially leads to killing of good ideas. Uh, so you should be careful not to do that. Design policies for larger socioeconomic contributions and develop a supportive and diverse ecosystem that attracts and, you know, which attracts people who are interested in productization and entrepreneurship. So if you're a university, it's not important to just attract good PhD students. You need to attract people who are willing to work with them to take things ahead. Uh, and that is the hallmark of, uh, of academic environments, which are also innovation ecosystems, right? And aim, to, uh, aim uh, for attracting maximum amount of innovation funding. So if you want to track any metric, um, much more than income on tech transfer, focus on how much innovation funding an idea has raised, okay? How much money is it attracting and how much money is attracted to that idea? How well are you able to generate resources around that idea? That's a reasonably good short-term metric uh, compared to any other metric uh, for uh, this. For scientists and students, good sci science or brilliant technology ideas are not enough. You need many other things to fall into place, right? Uh, understand the important of, importance of other team members, in particular, the entrepreneur or the, when I say in quotes, because whoever brings an entrepreneurial attitude, that means they are looking at the end point. They look at the last opportunity, not necessarily the excitement of the science or the innovation uh, only, but the opportunity itself, right? Uh, or the investor who's financing the advancement of your idea and seek out those people. If you can find those people, it's very likely that you will have somebody to work with and take it ahead as well. And keep your eyes open for related co-developments that can impact your technology journey, as I showed you in the case of mRNA uh, vaccine, for example, and progressively de-risk technology. So a strategy is that, you know, you create a pool of ideas, keep de-risking them, see which one progresses ahead, advance those which progress ahead even further, and so on. And it needs a little bit of patience and discipline of uh, looking at risk and managing that risk. But nonetheless, that is a good way to uh, look at it. And Technology transfer does not stop with the licensing agreement. You need to support your partner. Uh, please remember, by filing patents and other intellectual property, you are actually reducing risks for your commercialization partner, right? You're creating an opportunity for them to also raise money. And that is something which is very valuable. So uh, IP should be also seen in that context as you facilitating the ability, uh, making a your own idea more attractive and taking it uh, all the way to uh, market as well. Uh, and focus on attracting more resources, people, money to advance your idea. Uh, do not worry about short-term financial gains. Okay. A couple of quick other points out here. 
uh, for scientists and students, there's something called a value proposition mindset, which is very important to create. Many of us, when we are working on ideas, we just look at the, 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 the science component of it or the creativity of it. We don't look at the value proposition component of it. And that is something uh, which one uh, needs to learn as academics. Okay. Um, so what is a value proposition? Basically, value proposition is about imagining an end product uh, that you're going, that's going to come out of your efforts and then seeing who would be interested in buying it and then thinking about what benefit, not features, what benefit that product delivers for that user. So if it's a doctor who's going to buy an instrument from you, it's not about your, that your instrument is made out of some titanium. It's about what benefit it delivers. That means it is, it is lasting longer or it is able to do certain procedures which we cannot do otherwise those kind of benefits that it delivers and how does it compare with the alternatives that the user end user or the customer has uh, is something which you need to ask okay and that value proposition mindset is very very important to cultivate uh, and there's a good way to do that also called the value proposition canvas which i i encourage all researchers to uh, consider learning about um, and this I'm, I'm going to keep it very brief you can get more of it uh, in the aim prime site um, uh, youtube videos are there on this but uh, just briefly speaking uh, when you think about technologies which you want to see being used you want to think about what who is the customer going to be what is the outcome they are desiring what are the gains they would get out of using a product that you make and what are the pains they will reduce and then look at your product and see how it either has some things which create that gain or relieve the pain. Okay, uh, I'll just keep it very brief here. Uh, you can find some of these charts in the site called strategizer.com. It's free. Uh, it's called the value proposition canvas. And this is a good uh, tool to use uh, if you're a researcher trying to develop products uh, which are directly useful uh, to people and which are easier to communicate, uh, the value of which is easier to communicate to the end user and the customers that you're going to deal with. So at this point, I will take another short break. Here is a form that I'm going to throw up again. So please uh, keep your eyes open on the chat box. Okay. And let's go and ask the question of what difficulties do you face when you are commercializing your technologies? By the way, these questions which are coming up on the chat box, keep putting it up. We will take it up, but uh, not immediately. Okay. There's a, there's a form on the chat box. Please look at it and let's go. Let's uh, fill that up. Yeah. Oh, did I, is there any difficulty in that form? Can somebody try it out, please? No, we are able to access it. Yeah, okay, good. So I'll put up the responses, just give me a minute. Okay, so we have about 20 responses. Okay, and uh, 24 now. So what is this difficulty, right? Top difficulty, we cannot find an industry partner or a licensee right? Uh, a few others, which we are seeing here, tech transfer office or business development office is not uh, probably supporting them enough or no funds to advance or de-risk the technology. Um, you know, we cannot find an entrepreneur that's not being listed here. Uh, pace of decision making or action is too slow right? Or it's not clear. So, uh, but of course, the main important point that people are throwing up here is that industry partners are not able to find who's interested, right? So this gap that you see between 
um, um, between what you're doing and what the industry wants or is expecting is something which is a clear pain point which everybody uh, faces. Part of the solution to solve that <laughs> lies in um, in actually communicating value propositions. And so the value proposition exercise is actually directly relevant to many of you over there. Um, so uh, see if you, uh, if you can use that, uh, but I will speak a little bit uh, more about it uh, as well. So let me come back now to the slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir, visible. Yeah, okay. So let's talk briefly um, about, um, um, I, I will slip, uh, skip a few slides. I'll be happy to take them up later, uh, but uh, we're coming uh, to the last segment. So let me take a few uh, moments to look at licensing to existing uh, companies. So the first thing to figure out when you're licensing to existing companies is what is being transacted, right? So what are you offering to people? Now, typical situations are these that uh, people, um, offer a know-how package. That means they say that I know how to do this. If you're interested, I'll teach you how to do it. And then you'll be able to do it on your own. So that's a package, which is a know-how package. It's basically a recipe. Now, uh, in this, one needs to understand that this could go with or without a right to exclude others. And the right to exclude others is what is called a patent, right? A patent is basically a right to exclude others from practicing the same thing. So if you have a valid patent, you should be able to exclude uh, others. So you can have know-how with the right to exclude others or know-how without the right to exclude uh, others. And you can imagine that that is an additional right and therefore should get you, uh, should be more interesting to a uh, a potential licensee, right? So uh, that is something which you want to build in if you want to do it as part of your licensing uh, process. But an interesting thing to keep in mind here is that this is a different item than the, than the know-how itself. People tend to confuse a, a right to exclude others from the know-how. There can be situations where a licensee doesn't need your know-how, okay? But wants your right wants to uh, take from you the right to exclude others. So these are two different items which can be transacted together, but they are not a one-to-one. -one, uh, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between a patent and a know-how. Okay. So there are many situations where people file patents, which, uh, which do not accompany uh, or which do not go along with know-how. So for example, you must have seen all these large transactions happening in the news where um, uh, say a Google or a Motorola or a Kodak or whatever are transacting uh, patents. And these are large, uh, um, you know, volumes of patents. Uh, not everything is accompanied with any know-how. In fact, they're just buying rights. Okay. Um, so that they can practice whatever they are doing already without an interference from other people, okay? So uh, you can actually transact a patent without having any know-how. And that is something to keep in mind as well. It's also a source of value uh, that you bring to the table. And of course, along with it, when you do this, you could work with your partners. There might be something which you might need to add research and technical support, scale up, valorizing, and so on. So a typical offer <coughs> may have all these parts in different combinations. And Depends how you can valorize it. Now, when you present a know-how, if you give me a recipe, uh, say how to make a kheer, um, unless I know that the kheer is something which everybody wants to have, I'm not going to take that recipe from you, right? I'm not going to pay for it, right? So you need to con communicate and demonstrate why that particular sweet dish or kheer is so interesting. That's about talking about benefits for the customer or the user. That's what the value proposition statement was about. Most scientists we find <coughs> don't know how to communicate value proposition. They only talk about features. They will say, my technology has this, 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 this point. But so what? So the typical way of extracting that is to ask question, the so what question three times. That is you ask the question, tell me so what, right? And why should I care? Who cares, right? That's the question to ask, right? And then you're able to gradually build up the case for, um, uh, you know, value propositions. Okay. 
Um, just a quick introduction to IP out here. Of course, you can have various different types of uh, intellectual property, both formal and non-formal ones. The formal ones are the ones the government has recognized and has provided certain rights. These include, for example, patents, industrial designs, copyrights, trademarks, plant varieties, and so on. And of course, you can have uh, uh, things which you don't disclose, which is like, for example, trade secrets, uh, and you might need to protect them through agreements and so on, but this is not something you disclose. Uh, but remember that when you put out, uh, when you file a patent, it's actually a public disclosure. The deal is that you disclose it and in return, you get 20 years to exclude others. Okay. So that is a very, very quick intro to IP. But when you do all of that, you must keep in mind, uh, uh, you know, the first thing to do in any, uh, whenever you're transacting any kind of know-how or IP is to first ensure that the ownership rights and the commercialization rights are very clear, right? So uh, this is something which many uh, institutions ignore. Uh, they leave it gray and they're trying to figure it out after the party approaches them. They, it should be very clear who owns the know-how, who owns the IP. And usually this is described through IP policies or agreements. It might, it might be described through your own uh, employment agreements or through some of the policies of the institutions which you have subscribed to, right? And uh, this is something which should be very clear and unambiguous if you want uh, to license your technology out. Uh, clarity is really critical and there shouldn't be too many fingers in the pie. The more the number of people having a say in this matter, the more it gets complicated. We have had situations where two different institutions have two different ideological viewpoints and therefore, uh, you know, um, are not willing to take a decision, right, in terms of uh, exclusive licensing and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, plus, if it's a commercial party, they might have other considerations to block a deal, right? So, therefore, it's important to keep it simple and clean, and the ownership should be, uh, um, uh, you know, preferably held by a single party as far as possible, right? Okay. I think one more. I need to mute somebody out here. Okay. Fine. Now, um, going ahead, uh, technology transactions can be of different kinds. You, the originator, the creator can be a not-for-profit or a for-profit as a company can also be a licensor. Uh, academic organization can be a licensor or there can be others. The transaction could be one of sale or a license or an option. The sale is one where the entire ownership shifts, whereas the license is one where, you know, you're only giving limited rights. It's like where you sell a piece of land, whereas you give a license to, to use that land for some period of time, right? This is the, that's the difference between a sale and a license. And an option is to retain a right for a future day uh, to be able to use it. So you might say that I'll pay you some money to keep that land idle for some period of time so that in one year from now, I can uh, buy it from you. Okay, so that's an option, right? It's a, it's, it's a, uh, it's giving a time period to somebody to come back and strike a deal, right? Um, and of course, a destination for the technology can be a for-profit or a related spin-out company or a not-for-profit as well in some cases. And uh, the consideration can be multiple cash, equity, and so on. The ones in blue are the ones that typically academic organizations are dealing with, uh, but they can be multiple. When large companies, there can also be a lot of barter or strategic or tactical arrangements. There can be cross-licensing that I will license you my technology, you license your technology, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of complicated trans technology transactions transactions that can take place and uh, uh, the most simplest ones which not for profits deal with are those which they're licensing to a, a larger company or an existing company so the typical workflow for a scientist is you know uh, or a, a facilitator is one of building clarity of ownership protecting the ip marketing it and then you know finding people who are interested qualifying them uh, getting it ready for a deal and uh, if they're willing to strike a deal, go in for a deal structure uh, where the legals are firmed up 
uh, the structure is known, what you're transacting, to what extent, for what applications, all that is very, very clear. And then come to the financial terms and there's a deal closure that happens after that. And post that, you can have other things like, for example, uh, as a scientist, you may need to demonstrate the technology to the licensee. Uh, that you might give them a manual, you might do a demo training and some documentation and some handholding. Uh, and then a contract management takes place where, you know, you have a licensing agreement and you're basically ensuring that the licensing agreement is followed, right? Both you do your commitments and that person does their commitments uh, uh, as well. Okay, so that is the next part of uh, that. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time here since we'll run out of it, but I, I wanted to point you to this talk uh, on uh, on the AIM Prime YouTube site, which is about in and out licensing by uh, Dr. Ashley Stevens, which uh, all of you will find useful. Uh, the, if you just Google uh, uh, AIM Prime on YouTube, you should find this, right? Um, so just briefly, um, you know, you could be doing many different types of licensing. In licensing is when you're licensing in technology into your organization. Out licensing is when you're giving it to somebody else. And cross licensing is when you're doing it mutually between two uh, different organizations. I think I, uh, now when you're licensing, you can also limit the license in different ways. So you can limit the number of licensees. You can limit the applications. You can limit by scale. Uh, you can limit it by geography. You can say only in India, uh, only in US and so on, or you can limit it by duration. Now, by doing that, you might create pockets of, uh, one thing is that your licensee may only need uh, that much rights and you don't want to give you don't want to uh, give them if you know uh, having too much rights can be costly for them at the same time it's uh, it will not it will be underutilized so you might want to see how to make best use of the assets in your uh, in your disposal so it is it, it is like let's say that you have a bunch of um, uh, tools with you and you're splitting the tools to different people so that they make the best use of it and maximize the impact uh, uh, from that know-how or the patent right um, by the way the us experience shows that bulk of the licensing happens to small companies okay not necessarily large companies and much of the licensing to startups is uh, uh, very often uh, it is exclusive uh, whereas uh, you know when they're doing it for large companies so they might be foundational enough that they are non uh, um, exclusive so just keep in mind that you should be open to both those possibilities and you're just you might need to find out what your organizational policies allow uh, um, uh, in terms of the kind of licenses that you can do you can get uh, uh, compensation in terms of upfront fees ongoing pre-commercial payments uh, research collaboration and support uh, sub licensing income or earned royalties royalties uh, you know the payments which accrue later as running royalties on sales and so on is what we mean by that so i think i'm not going to spend too much time on this please uh, excuse me on this <coughs> an important point to remember is that if everything works out and your um, licensee is very successful the bulk of your returns to your organization will actually come later Okay, uh, and uh, <clears throat> it is important to keep that in mind when you're uh, when you're setting up a deal. Uh, do not ignore the running royalty terms. Uh, in 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 India, sometimes people tend to uh, put a premium on the early money that comes in. It's okay. You might have reasons for it, uh, but that said, <clears throat> this larger part is uh, as I told you that windfalls happen once in a while, and you cannot predict which one is going to be that one. So you might want to keep those options open. Uh, you should not think um, like an accountant in this case, you have to think like a forward thinking, opportunistic manager and not necessarily as a, somebody doing a postmortem uh, on the data. Um, I think uh, um, a quick lesson out here is uh, that Try to, as a facilitator, please try and close as many deals as efficiently as possible. Closing deals is more important than the revenue that you're generating. If you close many more deals, you'll have many more uh, plants that you have planted. And hopefully one of them uh, will bring you uh, rewards uh, that you can talk about as well, be it impact or be it uh, financial, right? 
and please provide terms and support to help your licensee reduce risks, raise funding and investment and expand business possibilities. One of the things I told you was that it's better to focus on how much innovation funding your licensee is able to raise. So try and see how best to um, facilitate that in terms of in whichever way it is. If it's a startup, how much money are they able to raise? And uh, if they can raise, if you can, if you can give them terms which will help them raise more money, that is the right uh, way to go. Okay. Uh, last few slides on startups and spinouts. Um, in startups, uh, the key thing here uh, in startups as opposed to MSMEs, I talked about small companies being licensors. Remember that startups are slightly different. Startups focus on for, uh, foresight of the future. So they are not necessarily looking and they build innovation into their organization. They're not necessarily looking at only taking things from you and then, uh, you know, that's so it's a one-time deal. They are trying to basically build innovation in their organization and they are trying to build, take something which will help them build that innovation in their organization. So it's a very different uh, type of organization. It is not to be confused with a micro or a small uh, enterprise when you're talking about uh, startups, right? And in science-based startups, you're basically leveraging science and foresight is leveraging scientific insights. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, and the way you finance it is quite uh, different as well. Um, so, uh, you know, when I talk about foresight, I'm talking about things like this. So, for example, uh, uh, you know, and imagine a future where all cars are electric vehicles. Cars are basically computers on wheels and not anymore the car that you see as a mechanical, uh, you know, uh, uh, vehicle. Um, here, that is a future vision of the future. Or that processes are, you know, invariably it's going to happen that all your processors are going to be for portable devices eventually, right? So portable computing is the future, is what ARM believes, right? Um, in recent months, you must have seen uh, the IPO of a company called Oatly. Uh, it basically makes uh, uh, milk, vegan milk based on oats. And it's gone, uh, it's recently had a $10 billion IPO, right? Uh, you can, you, you can imagine that they have bet on a future where increasingly people will probably stop using um, animal-based uh, milk and switch over to vegan milk, right? Whether it happens or not is a different matter, but that's the foresight that they are talking about, right? Uh, similarly, you know, uh, Apple and Microsoft both bet on personal computing, one on hardware, another on software, right? When others were not willing to build on. So that's that foresight element, which is important in startups, right? Even in India, the companies you talk about uh, also, in many ways, have come up with their own foresight, right? Flipkart believed that India was ready for e-commerce when others didn't believe. Ola believed that tax, they were ready, India was ready for taxis on demand like uh, Uber, which other people did not think so. Same same thing with Paytm uh, um, as well. So uh, Dr. Premal, uh, sorry, we have yeah. 10 minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So uh, keeping this in mind, if you want to create startups and spin outs, uh, you as an as an academic organization, uh, this is a simple uh, view of the recipe. Three things we uh, as uh, Venture Center, we try to align. One is the technology provider or the R&D person, the, the person who's coming with the technology. Second is a committed entrepreneur the person who is committed to the end point that means the opportunity the business opportunity wants to see the products and services in place and finally the funding okay uh, the funding becomes very important in india because many of the science-based startups are driven are originated by first generation entrepreneurs who don't have deep pockets and therefore uh, they have to align funding now, when all these three fall into place, the confidence in the team grows and they're they are, they are in a position to set up a company, right? So we try to align all these three together and bring them together and therefore try and see how we can uh, create a startup or a spin out out of it. Um, and that, uh, that, and I can tell you that the toughest challenge here, um, I don't know what each of you would guess. Uh, if I was to ask you in the chat box, can you guess which of the three is the toughest out here for academic institutions? Uh, first, A, B, or C? A being technology provider, B being committed entrepreneur, C being funding. Anybody wants to hazard a guess in terms of A, B, or C? Okay, we have several Bs there. 
a few Cs, right? Yeah, interestingly, it's B, okay? Uh, the, the, the real challenge is in finding people. So if you get a chance uh, to, uh, so lessons for people here is one, build ecosystems where you attract a lot of people who want to be in bucket B, right? Uh, many academic institutions attract people who want to be in bucket A, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the B part is often forgotten. Maybe, maybe uh, you would think business schools would attract probably B, but that's not so. As you know, many of them would look for placements, right? They would not look for startups and so on and so forth. So, 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 so the, how do you attract B is a very important challenge for all ecosystems. How do you bring them to the table? How do you interest them? And how do you uh, make it worth their while to pursue a given uh, idea and take it uh, ahead? Okay. So, um, uh, the other a few points, one, how do you spot a technology which is suitable for new ventures? Hmm? Uh, just one minute, there's something. Yeah. Now, um, not all technologies are suitable for new ventures. So suppose you were developing a catalyst for a uh, uh, say a petrochemical plant, which, you know, a process which Reliance runs, uh, that may not necessarily be a new startup because, you know, that, that the, the, you need the entire thing to make it run. You know that there will be so many people who will be interested unless it has like sweeping applications across the board. But if let's say that you're building a new battery, right, which is going to be path breaking uh, and you know that it's going to solve a problem five years from now when say lithium is not there, uh, uh, that could be a startup, right? So foresight is very important. Also, the the nature of product and service that you're working with is it, it, it is it a platform of some kind? Uh, is it something which that can stand on its own and doesn't depend on too many complementary technologies and investments? Doesn't need a whole petrochemical plant there to make it work, right? And is there a committed entrepreneur uh, willing to bet on it? Some of these things de decide whether you're ready for a technology a new venture or not. And for first generation entrepreneurs in India, of course, grants are very important, but it's also important important for one more reason. Uh, in economies such as India, compared to other economies, uh, the typical investor has multiple options to get a good return on investment. Okay, So investment in innovation competes with other investments, uh, which can produce similar kind of returns. And innovation is inherently risky. So in order to improve the rate of invest returns for investors, it's very often important that we advance the technology far enough uh, on uh, money that doesn't cost the investor more, right? So therefore the return on investment increases. So grants are a way of doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why grants are so critical uh, to building innovations. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, in India, we are fortunate now that there are multiple sources of funding available. So uh, today, uh, by the way, there's a website called funding.venturecenter.co.in. You're welcome to all of you can use it. Uh, today, fortunately, all these green pockets of money are available. This map uh, basically shows different pockets of innovation funding. Uh, and you will find uh, that uh, in recent years, a lot of government support has come up in the early stage. Uh, this is the last 10 years or so, um, and uh, which was not there in the past. Uh, but still there are gaps, right? Before in the early part, it was only for, you needed to leverage only family money to do it. And therefore you had a lot more family businesses than uh, first generation businesses. Today you can, you, first generation entrepreneurs can actually take the plunge and make this possible. So this is a great opportunity. Uh, the question is, uh, people need to see that as an opportunity and build something uh, quite uh, remarkable out of it. There's still a difficult zone. Uh, if you can cross a, this difficult zone out here uh, and get to a stage where your investment ready by VCs and PE uh, funds, uh, you're actually in a much better point, much better stage. Okay. Uh, you, you do have lots of funds available at the later stages. Uh, the challenge is how do you get that far okay and how do you take it that far so a lot of things a lot of people a lot of companies a lot of startups and technologies fail somewhere in the between just because they fell into one of those chasms which i uh, uh, talked about as well so as far as academic institutions are concerned this is one way of making spin outs and startups work the r d organization typically uses the help of a not-for-profit 
to work with a startup company, which takes it ahead. Uh, and the arrangement is such that the R&D organization, if it's a tax exempt, not for profit, utilizes the help of an approved incubator or somebody who can hold uh, any equity to, uh, to, um, to make it possible for the startup company to get started. Okay. Uh, and that is uh, something which uh, I, I won't have time to go into details, but that's quite important. There's a very useful provision of the government of India, which allows uh, many scientific and academic research institutions to uh, float such companies. In fact, uh, it's quite a path breaking development from 2009, where DSIR announced this program by which researchers can actually float companies, uh, except for a few DRDOs, ISROs and so on. Uh, this is applicable to all. Uh, institutions have to adopt this a policy in order to uh, take this ahead. Okay. Uh, of course, when you do startups and spin outs, you have to know how to manage conflicts and you have to draw some boundaries. It's not about you cannot avoid conflicts entirely, but you can disclose them and avoid them as much as possible. <laughs> and it helps <clears throat> to have mature uh, thinking and uh, little far thinking people who are guiding uh, that process and taking decisions along the way so that a larger view is taken and not a very limited uh, short term view of the whole uh, process. Okay, so I'll come to the closing remarks and at the end right now, um, I just want to encourage all of you to consider, uh, you know, championing your own ideas. Uh, keeping in mind the facts and pointers that I've given you, um, it is. It uh, I don't want people to think it's uh, impossible. It is. It it is a journey which one needs to work on. It's not to be taken very lightly, but it is something which is very exciting because you can imagine. Uh, here was Professor Alexander Graham Bell, a professor from Boston University, who. Uh, you know, who nobody believed that his telephone was going to go anywhere. Uh, and today it, it's there in everybody's pocket, right? Uh, and that is the opportunity that you have when you try to take your ideas to realization to the market, right? And uh, perhaps in the coming days, you'll hear about uh, these two people uh, who uh, made possible uh, the non-immunogenic nucleoside modified RNA uh, the back end of BioNTech and Moderna. And uh, if that happens, this will be another, uh, uh, another great example of taking technology to market and people who, who, who strive to do that despite the odds making it uh, uh, possible. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's nice to have such success stories because otherwise, uh, you know, uh, you only get to, uh, you, you, you have people who have made a real difference uh, with their science to people's lives. Um, um, you know, I think it would be great if many, many more of them uh, are rewarded. And I hope many of you are able to be uh, those uh, as well. And of course, at the end, uh, we are all contributing to this virtuous cycle. So it's important that all of us do contribute in as big a way as possible. Uh, this is, uh, I can't think of any other way of fueling innovation. So if we don't create profits by products and services, there's no other way I can think of, of funding uh, research. And, I mean, even your government uh, grants come through taxes and that also has to come through this process only. So there's no other way that we can go. It, uh, and uh, as a country, uh, moving into an innovation economy uh, basically means going, getting into a high, high risk, high rewards uh, activity over a period of time, which solve real world problems. And that's basically what uh, innovation is all about. Okay, so I'll stop.